Well, good afternoon, everybody. I have, um, in the last two days, 48 hours, I've been in Washington, D.C., New York City, uh, Virginia Beach, Richmond, and now here. And uh, I would not miss this to be with a very special person on a very special occasion today. So thank you all for joining us um, today. Now, I know everyone knows why we're here today. But before introducing our 27th president, I'd like to say a few words, maybe indeed several words, to reflect on his stewardship to date. And I'm going to emphasize to date as two very important words. To date, Mr. President. Right? Okay. Because we still have much to do and much to accomplish. Now, flash back to 2008. Things were a little bit unsettled at the alma mater of the nation. The Board of Visitors makes a critical choice and asked Taylor Reevely, then our dean of the law school, to become president of the college, an interim president in a transitional period of time. An interim president asked to stabilize the situation and, very frankly, get things back on the rails. The board then wisely chooses to remove the interim label. At that point, a leader in this type of situation has a clear choice. Will I be merely a transitional leader or will I be a transformational leader? The default choice for many leaders is to be purely a transitional leader. Now, very fortunately for this great university, Taylor immediately chose to be a transformational leader. Taylor's accomplishments to date, again, I'm going to keep saying to date, an important phrase, have been numerous. And we will have ample time in the future to more fully recognize all of his many accomplishments as our leader. So I would just like to highlight a few of them. Immediately upon becoming president, Taylor took up the leadership mantle to challenge his team and the Board of Visitors to come up with a more sustainable financial model. Like with all major initiatives, Taylor worked, with, worked the details, the data, and the facts to come up with a bold plan. In partnership with the Board, we adopted the William & Mary Promise, a new financial model for William & Mary. The objectives of the William & Mary Promise are important and reflect the President's leadership. First, to provide predictability to in-state students and families through a four-year tuition guarantee. Next, to make William & Mary education affordable for all in-state students and families through enhanced financial aid. To drive business innovation across the university to lower cost and very importantly, to provide the resources necessary to retain our faculty and staff and attract new faculty and staff to our beautiful campus. After the board enacted the William Mary Promise in April of 2013, I remember walking with Taylor to the Wren Building to, rent, to ring the Wren Bell to celebrate this significant accomplishment. He told me it was a great day for William and Mary. And he told me he was personally going to lead the effort to raise $1 billion for the college. Now, in 2011, when I went on the board, the idea of raising $1 billion would have been met with some very funny smiles on people's faces and a simple statement, are you nuts? <laughs> but as you know, we are now on our way to raising $1 billion and more to provide the resources to ensure institutional excellence and, very importantly, pay it forward for future generations of students, faculty, and staff. Taylor has also made the $100 million fundraising year the new norm at William & Mary, after only having done this one time in the previous 300-plus years of the college's history. <coughs> Equally important to our philanthropy efforts, Taylor has stressed the critical importance of lifelong engagement creating the new Office of Advancement, and setting a goal of 40% for annual alumni participation in making gifts to the college, a level only second to the vaunted Princeton University. And I'll have more on Princeton in a minute. While the William & Mary Promise and the For the Bold campaign are two of Taylor's most significant accomplishments, there are many, many others 
that I will leave for another time. Let me close by making some more personal comments about Taylor, Taylor Reevely, the man, and Taylor Reevely, the leader. First, his relationship with students. Taylor loves all of our students and cares deeply about their well-being and personal development and, very importantly, how they will later serve their communities and our great country. After a Charter Day concert for our students at Kaplan Arena, where we had a true headline rock band perform, I was told by my daughter that the student line to greet our president was much longer than the line to greet the rock band. <laughs> now, I asked my daughter, why? Why was this so? And she replied very simply, quote, T-Dog is a rock star. <laughs> she said, we love being with him because we know he loves us. That love of students was evident at a lunch of former rectors when one of them asked Taylor, what is the most important thing to him as president of this university? He could have answered this in many ways. He answered it the same way three times. He said it's the health, well-being, and development of our students, our faculty, and our staff. And this is truly the essence of Taylor Reevely. Let me talk about servant leadership. To me, Taylor epitomizes the absolute best characteristics of what it means to be a servant leader. Putting others in this great college first. Understanding what it means to live inside the fishbowl, where others are always watching from all sides the actions of their leader. In this regard, Taylor has led this great university with high intellect, great character, courage, and a genuine and deep passion for the mission of higher education. His mentor and great friend, the late Bill Bowen, the president, former president of Princeton University, would be very proud of Taylor on this day. Let me close by saying that I have personally enjoyed serving on this board and working with Taylor more than any other board I have been privileged to serve on. And I'm getting older, so there have been a lot of them. During our, time, during our time together, I've only found two real character flaws. Everybody has character flaws, Mr. President. The first is that he refuses to drink water and hydrate properly. <laughs> even in 90-degree days wearing wool suits. Now, with Helen's full support, I once threatened him that I would get a formal board resolution requiring him to drink water if he didn't start doing it himself. We haven't made much progress, unfortunately. His only other character flaw, and this was really early on, was his mentioning of that fine university to the north in New Jersey, Princeton. Now, Princeton became the Voldemort think Harry Potter novels, the word that no longer could be spoken without a $200 per instance contribution by Taylor to the College of William and Mary. <laughs> Matthew, I think you got a big gift coming. <laughs> In all seriousness, Taylor loves his alma mater, Princeton, as he should. But I can also say with supreme confidence that Taylor has also fallen in love with William and Mary, the alma mater of the nation and I know you love this university dearly. Helen, thank you for being such a great partner and a wonderful first lady of William & Mary. And you gotta keep working for 15 months more too, by the way. <laughs> Taylor, my friend, congratulations on all that has been accomplished again to date. I'm gonna keep saying to date, that's a very important phrase. I told a reporter this morning that in keeping with your great work ethic, I was certain you would be the last person out of the office on June 30th, 2018, turning out the lights of the Brafferton. We still have a lot more to do over the next 15 months, Mr. President, and I look forward to doing it with you. Finally, Taylor, I want to thank you for taking care of our college. As you know, a plaque hangs in the boardroom, and it has a simple but powerful phrase and admonition from Ann Doby Peebles, a former rector of this college. It says simply, 
take care of the college. Thank you for doing this with such a plum, integrity, dedication, and commitment. Ladies and gentlemen, the 27th president of the College of Women Mary, Taylor Reevely. Mr. Rector, thank you for those really extraordinary words. They mean a lot to me. It has been an absolute delight to work with you, Todd. And as you say, we got 14 months to go. Well, I feel right this red hot moment like I did when we officially launched William and Mary's billion dollar campaign in a giant white tent pitched in the sunken garden. The fact we were having a campaign was by then no sudden revelation to those gathered in the tent. Well, in the same spirit, let me say now that my last day as president of William and Mary will be 14 years hence on June 30, 2018, after a decade as this iconic university's 27th leader. And I realize this is no sudden revelation for you all either. At that time, I'm going to be 75 and a half and ready to taste the sweet fruits of retirement. Each William and Mary president stands on the shoulders of prior presidents. I have been keenly aware of the debt that I owe to those who came before me, particularly those who shaped William and Mary's early success and those in more recent times who laid the foundation to restore William and Mary's preeminence. Presidents also depend enormously, enormously, on the work of countless colleagues to help push the university forward. A successful institution of higher education is always under construction, and its continued progress is utterly dependent on a team effort. My presidency has been blessed. It's really been amazingly blessed by colleagues of extraordinary ability, colleagues of extraordinary commitment. I would have been bereft without their good counsel, their friendship, their personal efforts for the good of the whole. During the colonial era, William and Mary was the leading institution of higher education in America. Uh, my prime ambition has been to quicken the university's progress back to its rightful place in the sun because I believe this will serve William and Mary's people well, and I believe it will enhance the good they can do for the Commonwealth, the nation, and increasingly the world. More specifically, my presidency has had four overriding goals. First, to pursue excellence in all that William and Mary does across the board, not just in our teaching and research. Second, to set audacious goals to stretch and galvanize us, even as some of them seem beyond reach. Third, to make our strategic planning a living process that actually gets reflected in the annual budget cycle. And fourth, to hammer home the reality that going forward, William and Mary's financial future and thus its capacity to keep excelling hinges largely on our own efforts. Faculty, staff, administrators on campus, parents and students, alumni and friends, with each part of the William and Mary family pulling strongly on its oar and no part standing on the sidelines failing to do its part. All of us our entire constellation of chancellors, 
rectors, board members, faculty, staff, administrators, alumni, friends, parents, everybody have really come together in recent years to make amazing progress. And as the rector said, I'm going to keep pushing hard for the next 14 months. I do not believe in becoming a lame duck. Now I realize the duck may approach and begin quacking, but I will resist the duck. <laughs> and if I'm not the last one to turn out the lights in the Brafferton on June 30, 2018, I'll be close. Now, I didn't go to college at William & Mary. I didn't go to law school at William & Mary. Indeed, I was pretty long in the tooth before I knew much about the college except its stereotypic reputation. You know, really old and historic, really, really hard academically. So how did William & Mary come to capture my heart and my mind with the force that it has? How did I come to have such respect and affection, indeed love, for a school I never intended, never attended, and never seriously encountered until I was in my mid-50s? Was I seduced by the physical allure of William and Mary's campus? Well, it is, by any measure, one of the most beautiful in the world. I love to walk its varied precincts. I love that its western grounds flow into 700 acres of college woods guarded by druids, while its eastern grounds move seamlessly into the living reincarnation of the 18th century. Nobody else has a campus like that. Well, as I'm mesmerized by the rich history that William and Mary has lived over the centuries, you can't manufacture history if you haven't lived it. William and Mary has to be the most richly endowed with history of any institution of higher education in the United States. William and Mary has lived history to an astonishing degree since 1693 leading the way for higher education in key respects, educating leaders for our communities, states, nation, providing an indomitable way through times of terrible loss and turmoil, and providing a past from which the college can draw abiding strength for all time coming. Was well, it the high caliber of William and Mary's people that drew me close? Well, William and Mary's people are remarkably intelligent, hardworking, ambitious. They're also collegial, caring, and they're free of the cloying sense of entitlement that sometimes blights very accomplished people. They're the sort of people with whom you enjoy being and on whom you can count for splendid performance. Was my heart won by William and Mary's pervasive academic excellence and its commitment to becoming a research university while also remaining a great teaching institution and a great teaching institution for undergraduates as well as graduate and professional students. Was it William and Mary's unparalleled capacity to do more with less in all aspects of its life that was so inspiring for me. Even while we are moving heaven and earth to reach that happy day when we can do more with more. Was it the deep loyalty of William and Mary people to the alma mater of the nation and their pride in being its alumni and alumni? Well, of course, it was all of these elements and more that accounts for William and Mary's powerful hold on my respect and affection. I am now a member of the tribe, and I will be a member of the tribe until my last breath. Well, let me end by saluting the most important person in my life, 
Helen, my beloved spouse for 46 years, we have supported one another through thick and thin for almost half a century. And I can't imagine living in the president's house without Helen by my side. She has been, is, and will be a stalwart, caring, and all-around marvelous First Lady. When I became William and Mary's 27th president, I promised to do my best for this magnificent institution. And that's what I have tried very hard to do, to do my best. Some days were howlingly successful. Some days were dogs. But all along, I've been trying to do my best. And we've come a very long way together, you and I. Uh, it's been an extremely meaningful time for Helen and me. So thank you, William and Mary. Thank you for what you've meant to us and what you have meant to so many other people over the centuries. I really do believe the 21st century is going to be the most productive and successful in William and Mary's long life. I think in the years ahead, the college, the university, is going to do great good, really great good, for countless generations of William and Mary people and for communities, states, nations, plural, for the world. Now, I am told there are libations of some sort upstairs. So if you can um, leave the billable hours behind <laughs> for just a few moments more, let's go upstairs.